here with HIT 352 Health Information Systems. We are moving on to Chapter 5, System Implementation. This is the last half of Week 5, because Week 5 is Chapter 4 and Chapter 5, so this is the last half of the, of the week. So let's talk about system implementation. If you remember from Chapter 4, System Selection came before this, and I probably gave way too much um, detail in that, so we'll try and fly through here to make up for that. Our learning objectives for this one are here on the screen. Again, we're still on objectives 8.2, 8.3, 8.4, which equate to learning objectives 9.2.1, 9.2.7, 9.2.1, or I'm sorry, let me start that again. 9.2.1 through 9.2.7 and 9.3.1 through 9.3.3 and 9.4.1 through 9.4.7. I apologize for my scratchy voice. I've been talking quite a bit today. So here are our learning objectives for the, from the textbook, but then we also have ours from the syllabus. All right, what is implement, system implementation? Ooh, tried to put that all together, didn't I? What a mismatch. It is the process of preparing and launching the information system that has been selected for use. So you have to look at site and space preparation, user preparation, installing the hardware and software you're going to need, programming and customizations, user configurations and settings. It includes screen design, re-engineering processes, policy and procedure development and documentation, as well as a testing plan. Training, the actual conversion process that happens. And conversion is different than go live. Make sure you know that. It's different than GoLive. System evaluation afterwards. Physical location has to be considered as well as your data center. We talked a little bit about change management in the last one. It is crucial during the system implementation process that good change management happens to manage people's fears, to manage their expectations, and get users involved. So installing hardware and software, you need to figure out where you're going to do that. Is it just going to be at the data center, or are you also going to be doing it throughout other locations? And by other locations, does that mean a specific department or unit at the hospital, across the hospital, across an entire health system? Does that include outlying physician and provider practices, clinics? Does it include a skilled nursing facility that is owned by the health system? There are all sorts of things that need to be decided when you're installing hardware and software. Who's going to do it? Is this a vendor job or is this someone something that's going to be done by your own internal staff? Programming and customization. Who's going to be doing the programming and customization? Who's going to be doing your data conversion? Is that going to be your staff? Is that going to be contracted out? Is that going to be the vendor? Um, who's going to do it? What exactly are they going to do and when? How is this all going to fit into the implementation time frame. Settings configurations. You've got to decide what settings are you going to use. Are those settings going to be consistent across the whole organization? Or are they going to vary um, by specialty, department, unit, um, location? What tables are you going to do? And how are they going to be set up? And how are they going to be mapped from your old data to your new data? How are you making sure that they match up with regulatory requirements? Are they complete? Do, do each of your tables have all of the answers if they are hardwired in um, to make, if they're structured data, how do you make sure you have all of those elements that you need to answer each question or fill in each area? Screen design. Why even do screen design? Well, no single screen meets all needs. And especially, you're going to want to do screen design if your existing screen is not in a logical order for workflow or if it's too cluttered. It can, a good screen design can improve workflow. Rules <clears throat> for screen design. They need to be log there needs to be a logical sequence, left to right, top to bottom. They need to be titled. They need to have control numbers, standardized terminology, a standardized look and feel, the color. Are you going to permit blinking in reverse video? Graphical user interfaces. 
are you going to have those and, and where are they going to be at? How are they going to work? And are you going to have required fields? Are you going to put in hard stops anywhere that you can't move forward till you filled that in or answer that question? Or are you going to let um, the user blow past those? Can they skip those fields? Can they turn off those alarms? Those types of things. Reengineering, you want to evaluate the way that you do your business in order to improve efficiency. Just because you've always done it the same way doesn't mean that it needs to be done the same way in the future or that your new system will permit you to do it that way. Sometimes, sometimes reengineering happens because the system forces you into doing things differently. Not necessarily a bad thing, it just is. You need to develop your policies and procedures. So you may already have them in place. Do they need to be updated? Do they need to be changed? Do they need to, is this a good time to make them more consistent across the organization, to make them better defined or more specific? And what kind, and it, you know, how is this going to happen? What are your update processes going to be? Um, who is going to main, who is going to maintain the information system? And when, when is, you know, what's going to be all part of maintaining that information system? And don't forget your, um, from Joint Commission and Accreditation, your IM plan. Testing your information system needs to be done and not just once and not just with a few um, patients or a few tests. It needs to be done over and over again with larger and larger amounts of data. So testing plan, you can have different types of testing. Make sure you test your interfaces. Make sure you test your integration, your applications, the documentation, the conversion, all of that. It all has to be tested. Uh, there is an example where a hospital had a major HIPAA breach because whoever was doing mapping from their master patient index to their guarantors in their billing system did not do it appropriately. And when they went live, no one caught it. And it ended up going out where they sent PHI to people who didn't have a right under HIPAA to receive it. And they did that, I want to say, for like 40,000 patients. It was some obscenely high number. So I'm here to tell you, if you think you've done enough testing, you haven't. And if you haven't tested at least four or five times, you haven't tested enough. Training. Have you tested your training out? Last thing you want to do is get people in there for, for training and find out your training materials or your training system doesn't work. Especially if you're dealing with providers, that will immediately under, undermine the whole level of trust and support from your providers. Volume. You've got to decide on the volume of testing that you're going to do. Do parallel testing. Have multiple people running things at the same time and parallel testing. Um, and then at what point do you sign off on acceptance, either as the vendor or as the organization? The testing plan needs to describe exactly what testing is going to be performed, what the test environment is going to be, and then what happens if you run into trouble? How are you going to document it? How are you going to resolve it? How are you going to make sure that it has been resolved and hasn't returned and you followed up on it? Training. You definitely need a training plan and you need to think about the learning curve. How long is it going to take for each type of training that's going to take place for that learner to master it? Is it a matter of hours, matter of days, matter of weeks? It needs Your training plan needs to address all the learning styles, at least visual, auditory, and kinesthetic. At least those three. It needs to include and be set up for adult learning principles. Adults learn differently than children. We tend to be a whole lot more independent and we don't want to sit there and listen like a child in a desk at school. And so how are your, how is your training plan reflecting the fact that you're going to be teaching adult learners? You need to have trainers and super users. You need to have a plan as to when training is going to take place, what type of training will it be, and all that you need to make that happen. There needs to be a training schedule, and it can't just be on day shift. <laughs> um, there are people that work nights, weekends, evenings, holidays, 
you name it, people who only work partial shifts, people who are part-timers, people who only may work one day every six weeks, how are you going to make sure that you provide training for them in a way that meets their needs and, and helps them be successful? What modules are you going to use and have available? How long are they going to be? How long is it going to take to go through the training? Not just each module, but overall. And then the timing. When do you set the training to be? Do you set it to be six months from go live, three months from go live, six weeks from go live, four weeks from go live, two weeks from go live, or only at go live? It's going to depend. And you may have all of those kinds of timing. You may train your super user six months in advance because they need to be trained and be able to help with testing and be able to develop the training materials and then start the training at three months out. So you may have that. Learning objectives. You definitely have to have learning objectives. What is your training going to do? What is it going to teach? How do you know it's going to be successful? An agenda. Absolutely. So people understand, what is this all about? What am I going to learn? Why am I here? Teaching tools. You've got to have those to help you provide the teaching that they need. Content. Make sure you have this, the content of what you're going to be doing. Resources. What do you have in addition to fall back on if there are questions or concerns or someone wants a copy of something? A lot of places train the trainer. They have super users that become trainers and they do train the trainer training. Then there's actual conducting of the training that may be done by the vendor. It may be done by these trainers or super users. You evaluate your training. Was it successful? Did Were all your objectives met? Do you feel like your people are trained adequately to be sufficient at go live and to manage the learning curve? What kind of ongoing training do you need? And how is that going to play into things? Do you need that ongoing training two weeks after go live, a month after go live, six months after go live, a year after go live? How are you going to train when there are updates that come through? Is this instruction going to be computer assisted? Who's going to attend? Who's mandatory? Who's not mandatory? How do you provide copies of training materials? Are you going to do it in paper or are you going to do it electronically? Are you going to have it electronically through email or are you going to have sort of a training repository that they can go through on your organization's intranet? You got to have that figured out. Objectives, again, you need to know what it is you're trying to train so that you can see how effective it was. And then the competency test results. Did it work out? Did people learn what they were supposed to learn? The conversion itself, that's where you're converting data, the format or the content. And I'm sorry, let me go back. Conversions usually happen before the day of go live because you can't convert all of the data all at the very moment that you go ahead and you have the go live. So the conversion happens and it can happen even a week in advance or however you, however the organization and vendor decide to structure it or a day in advance, depending on the amount of data that you're converting. And um, so that happens. And then there's the go live. <clears throat> this is the time when you start using the new I, information system. There are different go live models. And of course, I have been part of this. At one organization where I was, we had seven hospitals. And we were implementing a new system. And the executive director of HIM that I worked for had the bright idea that we would do Big Bang, that all seven would go up at the same time and that we would be staffed to manage each one of those sites. Looking back, I think we would have been a lot better with a phased plan, and here's why. When you go with a big bang, you have no chance of addressing the issues in a smaller setting that you can fix or learn from before you phase it into the next setting. When you do big bang, if you've got an issue with your coding, it's going to affect every facility that you've implemented it at all at the same time. Whereas if you phase it, okay, you start, you start at one facility, oh, they've got a coding problem. We identify it, we get it fixed, so that the, when the next facility comes up, they don't even have to deal with it. There's a lot to be said for phasing. Um, another example would be organizational-wide. 
And then in that case, we were getting a whole new EHR system. And our, in fact, our whole healthcare system had purchased this new e EHR. And they were implementing it facility by facility. And we were the eighth facility to go live. It really helped that they phased it because by the time they got to us, there were so few issues. They had been through seven go lives already. Any issues that were out there had been dealt with because they had dealt with smaller facilities and bigger facilities than us. So when they reached us, they were well, they were a well oiled machine and it went so smoothly. So I'm a big fan of phased, not as much of a fan of Big Bang though. There are pilots where they will let one facility pilot it and then, or I'm sorry, not one facility, but one unit of the organization. So let's say um, they're putting in something new and they decide they're gonna pilot it on a med surge unit before they run it out to all the, all the nursing units. That's a pilot program. And there are advantages and disadvantages to piloting. Um, again, it's, it, it just really depends on what you're trying to do, how you're trying to do it, what kind of vendor support do you have, what kind of internal support do you have, how much testing has been done, how well are you prepared, um, did your conversion of data go smoothly, all those types of things. And then turnover strategies, is there a straight turnover or do you do parallel processing for a while? Parallel processing is where you're running the old system and the new system in sync before you get to a straight cutoff where you're just on the new system so that you can see the data is flowing into both systems, old and new, and still being processed. And you can make sure that everything is processing the way that it should in both systems before you close off the old and make it solely the new. And other places, <clears throat> they just do a straight or turnover. They end the one, the old system, start the new system and there's no parallel processing pros and cons to both i've been through both i don't really have an opinion except to say it depends on how well planned and how well executed it has been it comes down to the preparation that has gone into it a straight turnover can be completely successful a parallel processing can be completely unsuccessful it's all in that preparation and you cannot necessarily predict that unless you know going in that preparation, testing, training, everything is as ideal as it can be. Initial support is from the project team and the trainers. They're out on the units, out on the floors, in the clinics. They're looking to help people. There's also ongoing support, usually with a help desk. So then system evaluation. You've, you've done the conversion, you've gone live, now you're evaluating the system. Why are you doing it? You want to know, are your IS functions working as expected? What worked well? What didn't work? What needs to be fixed? What needs to be changed? And what to do differently next time? Or what to do the same next time that worked really well this time? And then how about routine maintenance? How often is that going to happen? When is it going to happen? What that is? Or is it going to be downtime? Is it going to still be real time in the background? You need to work all those things out. And that is it for Chapter 5 system implementation. A um, lot there. Many of you have probably been through a system implementation to have your own experiences and your own opinions you can bring to the table. That's great. Um, if you haven't been, don't worry about it. You've learned about it here. You'll read about it. We've got some case studies this week, um, a discussion, and then the quiz over Chapters 4 and 5. Hope you're doing well. Take care. Talk to you again soon. Bye.